Hi, I'm Bill Patton with USA Tennis Coach, and I'm back with David Smith. And we're going to talk, we're going to do some frequently asked questions. Uh, I put it out there to some people to say, hey, do you have some questions for Dave and I? And so if, if in the Facebook Live somebody comes up with a question, then I'm going to, to respond to that. But we've already sort of thought through some frequently asked questions so hopefully you know i you know i do believe you're going to get a lot of value out of this um before we get started i do want to do a, a little shameless plug um for those of you who are uh, mobile tennis pros or high school coaches that don't have a lot of space i love these scorecards these are these are awesome you know it's very sturdy and light and portable and they come in their little nylon bag and so you could it's really easy and it doesn't tear anything up in your car because you know those ones with the big metal poles and all that i don't know how many gashes i've had in my car from those but anyway that's a little shameless plug for the easy score plus from matchtough.com anyway dave how you doing today i'm great bill it's great to be back and talk tennis with you today yeah this is good i'm i'm excited so I'm going to kind of keep glancing down to see what's happening on the Facebook Live. But now, so this is going to be some frequently asked questions that we get from high school coaches. And, you know, if anybody else chimes in, that'll be awesome. Um, so what's the first question? Um, you, you, you had a question that was sent in to you by somebody? Uh, well, I get a, a, a few questions asked. One of them was, exactly or specifically what do I do to produce so many skilled players within a a large team and be uh, the short season that we are faced with and so a lot of coaches who are either learning the sport or learning how to coach more um, are always looking for better ways which I applaud obviously so when a question like that comes to me I'm more than happy to share um, not only my experiences and expertise but uh, you know I want to see these coaches succeed so that's probably one of the big questions okay how do I train 55 girls or 45 boys during a season and and especially those that are faced with limited resources mm -hmm. and that's a biggie because let's face it a lot of school programs just don't have the budget and I you know I always get a, a, another question that is commonly asked and that is should I get a ball machine mm. I, you know interestingly okay. if I had the choice between if I could buy five teaching carts full of balls and a ball machine I'd take the five teaching carts every day um, because I just can do so much more a mm -hmm. ball machine a good ball machine is going to be pretty expensive in around three thousand dollars for a good playmate yeah, and they're they're limited in their functionality, obviously, but they can be very very helpful. So um, yeah, because they stay in one place all the time. Well, you know, the, you you can't get the kind that definitely oscillate and variable. Those are even more expensive, obviously, that can vary the speed. But I, right. you know, we've we've created a number of really good movement drills as well as stroke development drills off of a ball machine because we do have a couple ball machines that we use. Probably the one thing I recommend, I, I, I'm, I don't know how many ball machine companies are going to hate me saying this, but the fact of the matter is most people who buy a ball machine, they use it for a month. Mm. Uh, and I'm talking about private, you know, uh, individuals who buy a ball machine, not necessarily a team. Yeah. Because the, 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 the putting it in your car, taking the balls out, loading it, putting it on the court, doing the extension cord or charging the battery, filling it with the balls and then picking up the balls after you've hit them all. If you don't have a ball mower, it gets old very quickly. Mm -hmm. And so a lot of people can get a used ball machine that has very minimal used uh, yeah. and, and get a, a decent one for a much more inexpensive price than buying a brand new one. Yeah. And, and with my high school teams, I would say that I'm using a ball machine maybe two or three times during the season. Yep. And then there's another funny thing that happens is that the kids start begging to use the ball machine, right? So yep. there's just this novelty and, and really it's kind of limited because, you know, the ball machine stays in one place. So 
So you're limited as to the origin of where that ball's coming from. But <coughs> Correct. One thing I like to do with the ball machine is actually move it to different locations on the court to simulate different shots coming at them. So creating a play situation that or where the or, or origin of that is, you know, the short cross court or from deep in the center of the court or from the forehand or from the backhand, you know, and and uh, you know, just kind of set up certain situations, run that through a few times, and then put the ball machine away for another couple of weeks. <laughs> well, I think that's a great point because so many people, it's, it's like teaching pros who feed from the center of the court every day, all day, and that's, they never feed from anywhere else. I think the ball machine has that same functionality of the coach uses their creativity and go, wait a minute, not every ball comes from the center of the court. They're, they're coming from different vectors, coming from a wide alley shot, hitting a sharp angle and, and setting up your lobs or, or volleys off the same idea is so critical. Yeah, yeah. The, the, other, the other thing I'll add to that is if a coach, one of the things that um, I've found is uh, usually if you're a high school coach or even if you're an academy owner, or have a, a junior program, and say it starts at three o'clock, you notoriously will have kids that show up early, um, depending on where they're coming from, how ready they get. So especially at the high school level, you get kids coming from different campuses or different parts of the campus. And so one of the things that we do is we do set up our ball machine early so that kids that walk out um, can jump right out either on the ball machine. We always have a serving court yeah. uh, so that there's no organization per se as far as a drill that you have to have a feeder or a coach you can just set okay run out there start working on angle volleys or go out there work yeah no, that's great and then so yeah a, and, and, and then you don't that. have this sort of this dead time of right. boredom of waiting for it all to start and all that yep. and then and then to them that's a reward for getting there more quickly so I've done that in the past too, where yeah, we got the ball machine out, and now as soon as practice starts, we'll go a couple more minutes on the ball machine, put it away, so only the people that got there early really got, got the to use it. time on the ball machine. So now I want to go completely the other way because sometimes what I will do is give my players one ball, you mm -hmm. know, because practicing with one ball is really an amazing thing to do. And it's, a, it's the complete opposite of per, you have permission to make, you know, 374 errors. Right. When you have the 375 ball hopper. But when you have <laughs> one ball, you have yeah. to take care of it. So, and then how, how sport specific is that? Because only one ball isn't at play when you actually play. So, um, you know, that was something that I picked up from Torben Ulrich, you know, who's quite the character. So he and Jeff Borowiak and and Moore and some other people would practice with one ball. So and that's that's also a great option for teams that don't have a lot of resources, you know. Yep. So you teach that kid. In fact, you know, write the kid's name on a Sharpie. This is your ball, <laughs> right? And love it. Um, you know, take care of that thing. All right, now, uh, so this question is from Caleb from Thief River Falls, Minnesota. All right, so uh, he writes in, "How do you set your singles and doubles lineups? How do you, how do you? I mean, your ladder. How do you, how do you start your ladder? How does the ladder continue as the season goes on?" Uh, great question. Um, because I've found in my 40 plus years of coaching and, and being involved with teams and coaches and whatnot, there's a, there's a wide variety of beliefs and philosophies dealing with the latter. Now we, I've learned, this is my personal opinion that you create a ladder, a singles ladder that is not dependent on a partner or a team being able to move up or move down. You are solely responsible for your own improvement and thus winning or losing in a singles ladder. We take our top seven from that ladder. In Utah, we have seven varsity members, and then everyone else beyond that is JV. And so in, there are some exceptions to this, but our ladder is determined by singles play because we want 
our players to feel responsible to improve and we want the players to feel the pressure of players below them going, hey, these kids are getting better. I better get better. So in terms of our ladder, we challenge almost every day, which I know a lot of coaches don't. Um, we want, I want my kids to feel pressure of having to keep improving and the ladder is the best way to do that. My, my dad did this very successfully uh, in California. I've done it in Arizona as well as California and now Utah. And without question, it is the number one motivating device or tool that a coach has to inspire their kids to say, wow, there's 22 kids below me that are trying to get my spot. And that's one of the reasons why we challenge now. There are some exceptions for us because we have to have our varsity set by a certain date to play all of our region matches, and that will constitute the ability to seed for the region tournament based on how many matches you won at set at say number two singles or number one doubles. So then we form our singles and our doubles players out of those top seven. Now there's a caveat: every so often, twice in the last 20 years. I've actually had a player, actually three times, I've had a player who was a far superior doubles player, but was not as good at singles and was actually beaten. I actually had a senior on my boys team last year who was beaten by several sophomore boys who had never played varsity tennis in singles because this kid was an amazing doubles player, but he could not play singles to, um, to save his life. So I had to make an exception to that yeah. in, the, in the role of going, hey, I've got a senior who's a state competitor who's played varsity tennis for three years. Do I pull him off my varsity because a sophomore who has no experience right. beat him? So there's when I talk to my kids and my parents at the start of every year, I say, I have one role as the coach, and that is to put the best team forward on behalf of the school and the team itself. For sure. So I have to make that decision sometimes, and it may go against that singles ladder philosophy. Right, right. So, you know, when I'm first getting started, what I like to do is take all of the people who want to vie for a single spot, because we play four singles and three doubles here in California. Some leagues here play six singles and three doubles in their leagues, but then when they get to the sectional level, they have to play four singles and three doubles to make it a little more uniform. But, you know, so I, I, I get all these kids that want to try for a singles varsity spot, and I'll have them do a round robin of 10-point tiebreakers. So it sort of takes the pressure off because if they happen to, you know, not do well in one of them, they can still make up for it in those future matches. So I just take the aggregate number of points. It also helps me to see, you know, a 10-1 versus an 11-9. Right. 10-point tiebreaker. You can, you can get a lot more information about how close it was uh, that way. But, you know, and so I start my ladder that way. And then, and then I go old-fashioned bowling tournament, you know. So we might have nine kids going for four spots. So, I'll, so then the next week, nine will play eight. Seven will play six, five will play four, um, three will play two, and one has a bye. And right. then the winners matriculate up, and then the uh, next week we'll have the new eight play seven, the new five, the new six play five, and we'll just keep going on, on that way until the movement stops. So once we've once we do it again and there's no movement, then I pretty much stop. And my, I'm on the total other end of the spectrum. I want the kids to know their place and understand their role and be very comfortable with the fact that they always play on this court and those people are always on, on that side because there's that sort of that ritual comfort level to that. Sure. Um, you know, and, and so I've, that's a really strong benefit. And it's also sort of a team unity thing. Now, my my exception is that if I see a player is improving a lot and that I have a have you know a strong suspicion that now they can beat that next player, then right. I'll schedule in a, a a match because 
because mostly what I want to do with my when my kids play singles is have them play sets with special rules. So, you know, we'll have we'll have them play and they get it bonus points if they come to the net or, you know, you know, sure. they, if they get a first strike point or if they can extend the rally, blah, you know, we just come up yep. with all these special rules. So, and yep. you can't really do that in a challenge match. Right. Right. So, um, so then how do you, how, where, where does the doubles begin or does the doubles just pretty much come through from what you just said? Uh, it comes through, you know, you take your top seven players and you, we've got to form two doubles teams out of those seven. So four of our seven are going to be play doubles. So in most years, it kind of spells itself out just because certain players are, are, are more either they like doubles more, they play it better than singles, or they recognize as in this year, in fact, it was real interesting, my number one girl who, who's been number one singles for four years we were stuck because we were so deep. She's, she was like, coach, if you want me to play number one doubles this year, I'll play number one doubles, which was a pretty bold or at least a very uh, sacrificial statement from her to give me the option because we were going to have a very difficult time because I had three, well, I had five singles players who were either state champions or state runner-ups in singles, and two of them were going to have to play doubles. So she made my job a lot easier, even though she ended up playing singles and played number one and was the state runner up of losing to Nia Tillett, who's nationally ranked in the finals of state. But she at least gave me that opportunity. But um, it was, it was um, it, in this situation, I had one girl who played doubles last year, really wanted to play singles this year. And I had three girls better than her in singles. And so she ended up having to play his senior year at number one doubles. They ended up winning state. Mm -hmm. And I think she recognized that my choice of playing her in the double spot was the correct choice. And so a lot of experience plays into that. A lot of how girls or boys um, pair up, um, how their personalities mesh. So it, it, sometimes it's tough. Sometimes it's a very easy. Last year was very easy. This year was a lot tougher because I was so deep in every category that, um, you know, I had a lot of girls who earned the right to play singles, but I only got three that can yeah, play yeah. singles in, in matches. So. Yeah. So for doubles, what I do is I will take what I think are the relative. I'll either, if, if I'm brand new to a school, then I'll sort of just randomly put kids into flights because then, yeah. Because then, then there's no sort of presupposed, you know, prejudged thing. And then the cream's going to rise to the top. But in right. subsequent years, I already know a lot about the kids. So I already start with my flights, you know, stacked the way I think they're going to end up pretty yeah. much. Yeah. But, yeah. but what I'll do is I'll take four kids and I'll have A and B. They'll, they'll play a round robin of doubles where each one plays with each one against each one. So they'll play three matches and it'll be either a seven point or a 10 point tiebreaker. And again, you know, I can see the points, the finite number of points because a set score can throw you off. Six, one could mm -hmm. be pretty close. Right. Right. And six, three could be a blowout. Right. Yep. But, yep. but 10 to one is 10 to one and there's no getting around that. So, but then, so what it, it does a couple of different things. A a, it shows who's a good partner with everybody. And then B, it shows all of a sudden, hey, these two blew those two out. So I'm going to experiment with this team to see if they really have some dynamic chemistry together. Yeah. So, so yeah. then I start pulling teams out, and then I redo it. And then what I'll do is in group one, um, whoever finishes last goes to group two. First first place of group two will join group one next time around on down the line they matriculate down they matriculate up and then and then you start to see who starts to get it right who starts right. to understand how to be a good teammate on yep. a doubles court so so I like that from the flexibility standpoint and then also from the fact that it gives lots of data and so it's not all based on subjective eyeballs of what do I feel should happen. 
And it's really weird when you get two not so fast lefties that that are the greatest team because I would never put a slow two slow players together, you know, or right. two lefties together ever, you know. But sure. if they're beating everybody, then I'm going to do it. Yeah. So you know, generally try to have a faster player with a slower player, somebody who's stronger at the net with somebody who has stronger ground strokes. You know, somebody who's more a risk taker with somebody who's more conservative in the way they play. So that you get this unpredictability and a mesh of personalities. That's a good point. Yeah. No, I, I think every year is different. And every year lends itself to different uh, combinations. And, and um, I, I, I think that's one of the fun things about coaching is just being able to – uh, not anticipate because every year is different and you've got kids that have moved up the ladder in the off season considerably that you may have not even anticipated them mm -hmm. making to that position. So, you know, all in all, I think coach like you and me both, we have flexibility, but we also have, I, I, I think it's important that the kids understand their responsibility and that they ultimately, I, I have way too, when there's one coach in town who's notoriously just says, okay, pick your partner, you guys go play, and all he cares about is the single players. And he doesn't, mm. you know, he doesn't even, you know, I've actually had a couple of kids tell me he just didn't, doesn't spend any time with the double spins. And it's like, you know, we, we kill him every year. And they don't, get, you know, he doesn't get the fact that the doubles teams are just as important as the singles players because that's where you're going to win your your championships. Um, and so, I I, I I really like the idea that um, as far as my ladder goes, um, the players believe that they have an equal opportunity, and if they work hard, harder, and harder, that they have an opportunity to move up. And so one of the things we do is on top of freezing our varsity at the region level, because we, like I mentioned, we have to, but our JV ladder challenges all year round. We, our ladder stays intact and we just pull the seniors off, move everybody up. And it's a very simple process. If they win a challenge, they get an up. If they lose, they have to take it down. Sort of the matriculation aspect that you were talking mm -hmm. about earlier. But um, you know, the, I've had kids, I mentioned this in both my previous books, and the fact that I've had a kid who started off number 43 on my ladder. I mean, the worst kid on my team in, in Southern California, he, his freshman year couldn't drop, hit the ball. And by his sophomore year, he was the number one doubles player in Southern California, the most competitive environment in the country, really, in, in most cases. The guy ended up winning 172 matches without a loss over three years. And here's a kid, any coach who cuts would have cut this kid. I don't cut, mm -hmm. so I didn't cut the kid. I was tempted to mm. because I didn't think he'd enjoy the sport. Mm. I really didn't. I honestly, even though all of this was many years ago, but I still had plenty of years of experience. And I'm like, I don't know if this kid's really going to enjoy tennis. Right. But I, I kept him. And he would beg any kid after practice to stay out, hit, drop balls, beat him. And he became a phenomenal doubles player. And that just goes to show you, and that's why I encourage coaches not to cut, because uh, as I write in my books, once you cut a kid, you basically have cut any chance to finding out what that kid could have done. Awesome. Uh, All right. Okay, I got, I got another question. Yep. Go so it. this question is from Mike Baugh. And um, Mike wants to know how do we teach strategy at different levels? So, so to brand new beginners, uh, to sort of the intermediates, and then, and then the highest level players on our teams. Okay, good, good question because high school team is, especially has the diversity of raw beginners all the way up to whatever high level player you might have. Um, we. Since we teach an advanced foundation, we teach all of our players, beginners, the same skills, the same strokes, and the same strategy as our advanced players. The advanced players can do more simply because they have the skill set to hit a more reliable, repeatable stroke with more spin, more speed, more pace, more control. 
and but the strategic elements i mean if we look at the hierarchy the the, the lowest level of playing tennis dink the ball over the court get it in okay? with no concern of where you're hitting it the next level is okay my my opponent's got a weak backhand i'm going to try to hit to their weakness that's Mm -hmm. the second lowest level there is besides getting the ball in play hit it to opponent's weakness then the third level of, of course is okay now I want to move my opponent so if I can control the ball we t we train our players okay how do we open up the court how what shots allow me to do that okay um, so before you go any further I kind of want to yep. throw throw something in so that we can kind of go up the ladder together rather than have you run through your thing and then I run through my thing. Yeah. And it's hard yeah. To together. But, Sounds good. You know, where I start is, is trying to get everybody to understand the value of hitting cross court. Absolutely. So, so everything is cross court, cross court, cross court. And even with my advanced players, I mean, they are tempted to hit down the line. Oh yeah. Too early in a point and then they get burned. Right. So anyway, yeah. so, everything cross court cross court cross court and then even with my beginners maybe they aren't that successful at that so so we go all right you tried to get across court but it didn't go there instead it went right at the opponent so we call that the you know stolen from sterling strother a cage shot right so if you cage them if you cage them if you keep them in the middle of the court then what I want you to do is I want you to intentionally try to make them run on the next ball and right. watch how difficult it is for them to get started. But, you know, uh, a, a book I would recommend, a couple of different books I would recommend are Alan Fox's Think to Win. Yep, great book. I mean, which is, I mean, it is so fundamentally basic, but great. I mean, that, I, I credit that with helping me learn how to win you know, at lower levels. And then yep. the other one is um, Paul Wardlaw's uh, Pressure Tennis and the so-called directionals, directionals, which uh, yeah. for whatever reason are a point of controversy among some. But anyway, two great books about, and they really zero in on the whys and wherefores of hitting cross court. And the, the, what, what made this kick in for me was when you were talking about making them run. Because if because the number one thing about hitting cross court is if you're keeping it cross court, then you are gonna run less and they are gonna run more. Especially if they hit down the line to you and you take that next ball cross court. Now let the running really begin. All right, so what's the next step? Well, it, it, and that is, let, let's take a look at that a little bit more. We, all of our drills are based on that, you know, the, the percentage tennis of cross court. And then uh, like Hank Fisker, who I've spoken with several times at, at different conventions. And when we're both lecturing at these things and talks about the $10,000 shot, meaning what shot am I looking for so I can get ahead in the rally? The minute a person goes down the line, if it's not hit as a winner, you're going to get behind in the rally in most cases because you're going to get pulled even further off the court. Um, and if you're, there's just so many dynamics, you're hitting to the shorter part of the court, you're hitting over the higher part of the net, et cetera, et cetera. So um, the, that whole aspect of hitting inside in and inside out forehands on the ad court, you're looking for a very specific shot. So that goes to the next question or the next level. And that is, okay, now we know we're trying to hit certain shots cross court, staying in the point staying ahead in the rally or even in the rally the minute i go down that line or if i hit a ball short in the middle of the court i'm going to be behind in the rally my opponent should mm -hmm. if they're a reasonable opponent are going to put me into trouble so now i've got uh, i've got to understand that aspect of okay if i'm playing a better opponent i've got to keep the ball in certain areas of the court but one of the things that i especially at the high school level um, we actually train our players, and this is my terminology, but I've heard it by others, and that is I tell people, my players, toy with your opponent. Mm -hmm. That mentality of toying with your opponent takes away the mindset of, oh, I'm going to try to hit a winner, and instead I'm going to hit the ball so my opponent can get to it so I can make him run to the other corner or hit behind them and make him get that one so now I can make him run. It, it changes the mindset away from 
closing out a point, which of course at the higher levels we want to do. Yeah. But to get to that point, a lot of times you never even have to hit a winner. Okay. One of the let me back on that point. That's a great, great Both. point. So um, Craig O'Shaughnessy is famous for saying you're the second most important player on the court. Right. So, so the, in the toying with them, what, what we ought to do. And then uh, Bill Tilden said, find your opponent's favorite shot and don't give it to them. <laughs> right. Right. And find out what their least favorite is shot is and save that for when you really need a point. So, um, so you put those two things together and I'm going to say that when we get into intermediate play and above, they can start to understand that the other player has a weakness of some type. Yep. So we want to toy with them in a way that feeds into their weakness. Like some kids, some kids only generate power when they're moving. Some can't generate power, um, you know, standing still. Right. Um, some, some move terribly and can't and have no control when they're on the move. Right. And so, right. so you, you find, or, you know, some people like high balls, low balls, fast balls, slow balls. Right. Yep. Um, they like more top spin, less top spin. So, you know, it's, it's really interesting how you can kind of probe to try to find out what's their least favorite shot, you know? Yep. Absolutely. So, yeah. 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 So, so then, so, but that, and that's more of the job of the intermediate because the beginner player is probably still too overwhelmed by the fact that the ball seemingly is coming so fast at them all the time and they're just struggling to get it in play. Right. Right. Yeah, and then, and, and then you, of course, go to the highest level and you create opportunities, um, like I said, the $10,000 shot or the inside-in, inside-out forehand. But those also lend themselves to be able to hit a drop shot instead of an attacking ball. Uh, one of the things we see, especially at the girls' high-level tennis, is every approach shot is hit deep. You know? mm -hmm. And we're feeding into a, a, most of these high-level girls have phenomenal ground strokes. All my girls do, all the top girls do. And so if I'm coming to the net, do I really want to hit an approach shot that feeds into this girl's ground game, which is, you know, money or the, or they lob. Right. So one of the things we, we start talking about is, okay, let's look at what are our options? How do we take that person out of that, that comfort level? Drop shots are a key hitting that. If you see a girl with a, or a boy with a full Western grip, they hate those low forehands. They hate the low forehands. So now you're now you're looking at the game in a proactive kind of uh, higher degree of skill level in terms of mind thinking. Okay, I, let, me, I, let me throw in a, a really good example at you. Have you ever seen Federer play Robbie Ginepri? Oh, probably years ago. Okay, when and Robbie I doubt you've ever him. seen. I doubt you've ever seen Ginepri win more than three games in a set against him, because. Full Western, right? Yep. And Federer would just come in with a little chip that would mm. land just short of the service line. Yep. Stay so dang low. Ginepri would come knuckles dragging, you know, <laughs> forward and pop it up. And then Federer would just go volley yep. winner, cross all day long. Winner, all day long. You know, and I've had a, that's, this is something that still comes into play at high level junior. See, oh, yeah. here's what I look for. I look for the kid who, when the ball's up the middle, they immediately run for an inside-out forehand. Sure. So, so I had a, one of my favorite matches I ever coached. We did exactly the Federer thing. So I had my player. So instead of, instead of hitting the ball, you know, and rallying with this kid, chipping so that the ball landed – short of the service line and then so this kid makes his automatic move to the inside but now he's being jerked forward right and now he's popping up these passing shots and or they're framing really them to pick up but the, the funny thing is is to the guy's credit he made the adjustment he started to see what was coming he would read that and he would jump into the court so then, yep. so then in the chess match of, okay, now that he's doing that, now go back to approaching to the corners again. Yeah. Right? So, so if you see him coming forward, go deep, right? And if he stays back, then chip short. And, you know, and then, the, and that's, that is also ties into your 
toying with your opponent thing. Yeah. So, yeah. but only I think high level kids have that ability to read and react to what their opponent's court position is, what their tendencies are on certain balls. Yeah. Um, well, and, and we teach all of our beginners learn a one handed backhand slice very early i mean it's 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 part of the backhand volley progression to the backhand slice because we want those kids to be able to take a hard ball and just reflect it back like a volley almost but with a, a slight cut so that's plays into the whole equation of well are you training your players to have that shot if you've got a player with a full western grip you've got to keep that ball low and usually short because that's where those players have the most trouble. And if that doesn't work, then obviously you're going to have to go to plan B. Yep. And uh, all those shots, so we, we train our players how to get a hit around the outside of the ball so they create more angle. Uh, they can hit curving passing shots that start outside the alley and curve back in, as yep. well as a cross court that, that pulls that player a little further off the court. So okay, we teach you're a lot be, of spin. You're going to be really happy with me because uh, <laughs> I'm experimenting with – the advanced foundation and i'm experimenting on my little adhd kid evan he's a squirrely little guy oh man but anyway i it, it won't be I, I it's gonna take me a time to to edit this video but his parents have given me permission to document evan's tennis journey right I love it. and so i've decided he's gonna be my guinea pig on that okay. and so at the end of this video, not immediately, but sometime in the next week or two, hopefully sooner, then there will be a link to me working with Evan in my interpretation of Coach Dave's advanced foundation. And then Dave can give his evaluation and <coughs> tell me if, I've, if I have to do things a little bit differently. But um, uh, Evan was surprised by the outcomes early on and uh Good. you'll see also the interventions that i've had to take with him because of the way he's wired he yep. is a very wound up little boy well obviously if you're going to teach the advanced foundation you probably go want a bigger uh, sample <laughs> than one i'm going to start with one right Let's now start with so one. we'll we'll see what happens i it's it's do i think i'm happy with it and you know, I'll try it out on Evan, and I might start converting some other people over. So tell me how your interpretation of the advanced foundation in terms of what specifically are you – is it the progression starting with the volley? Yeah, yeah. Doing? Like, yeah, like I started okay. with, with the volley, with the sharp angle volley, and then we yep. worked on some slice backhands, and he started slicing pretty nicely. And, Good. you know, and how, – how, you know, how do you like – isn't it kind of fun when they start – did you notice one very key point? When you teach them to hit an angle volley, and we start with the backhand first. Yeah. And they learn to take that ball parallel, almost parallel with the net on right. a sharp, sharp, sharp angle. Yeah. And they learn that they, they for some reason, that sharp angle does not promote a swing as much as if they were hitting, say, a deep cross quarter down the line. Oh, uh, okay. So the angle volley just created almost, I look for, when I coach, I look for things that uh, almost self work. So I don't have to say things like take a shorter back swing or don't, you know, don't swing as big or, you know, just meet the ball. These things that automatically I find promote the right aspect. And that's where the angle volley versus a player that's taught to volley deep. Yeah, that is such a great point. And I remember I was blessed to have been given my tennis teacher's certification course by Don Henson. No, oh, good Don, yes. Oh, man. And Don, and the phrase that I learned from Don that weekend was learning on demand. So if the if the activities you create demand a certain thing, then you're gonna get that thing. But if yeah, they, absolutely. But if they demand almost nothing, then you're gonna get almost anything. <laughs> so, all right. So we gotta we gotta wrap up in a little bit. But I just want to touch yeah. on on fitness, and I'm gonna go first and just give yeah. you my thing because because I do very simple fitness stuff. I mean, I might have uh, the kids do some sprinting, 
right? Yeah. And we'll split right. 10 times across two courts sideways, right? Yep. So, and the way I set it up is four groups. So this, this, these, they run, and then when they get there, this group runs, and then when they get there, that group runs, you know, group C runs, and when they get there, group D runs, and then A, and then B, sure. and then C, and then D. And what it does is it, it's, it's enough of a sprint that they're going to get enough to be able to run all the way across the court, but it also builds in the work rest ratio of about three to one. That's right? good. Yeah. You know, the, other, the other thing I do is I do spider runs ad nauseum, and that's basically you start at the center mark, you know, in the minute, middle of the court, and you touch right. at each corner of, yep. the, of the big rectangle. Yep. Um, and then return to the center mark. And, you know, that's also really good because it takes about 20 seconds, which is about the max you want to spend on an anaerobic exercise. Right. You know, and then again, you know, I might have four players on the court and each one will go. And so, so they get three times the rest. Sure. And that makes total um, sense. And then, then I, I think I made up a drill. I can't, I don't often claim this, but I, I think I made this up. I can't, cause I don't remember where I stole it from, but I have this one called net backs and it's, I need a better name, but they started the baseline. They run to the net, touch the net with their racket. Then they turn sides of the net and they go one, two, three, fake overhead, one, two, three, fake overhead, just in case they missed the first one. Then they, <laughs> then they sprint back to the fence and touch the fence with their racket and they sprint all the way back to the net and they turn their sides of the net and they go one, two, three, overhead, sidestepping, one, two, three, overhead, sprint back to the fence and then back to the baseline. And it's pretty stinking exhausting. And the number one benefit is that now they know the full the full dimensions of the court so they feel a lot more comfortable running back fast knowing they won't crash into the fence because they know where it is right? right right you know and another thing another fear that people have of of approaching the net is crashing into the net yeah so they know they know how, how, to, how to accelerate so they can touch their racket to the net Right. And they're not going to end up with, you know, with a net mark on their belly button, <laughs> you know. So, um, you know, but then obviously then they're also going to be a lot quicker to get back and up to hit overheads. And have yeah, I love, I love anything that, that where you're training a player to challenge the overhead. Because the number one fault, and, and just being specific on the overhead, but this kind of plays into what you're talking about, is that players, the lob goes up, the first thing players do is, they, they look up and evaluate the law <laughs> and then, yeah. then they turn or they, you know, by that time it's too late. Mm -hmm. And so one of the things we challenge, we tell our players, and that's, I love your drill because as soon as that log goes up, we, we tell our players, you have to assume you're going to get it. So the first thing you're going to do is you're going to chat what we call challenge the overhead. So that plays into what you're talking about. As soon as they touch that net, they're, they're already back you know, combing their hair back or whatever you want to call it. Right. Challenging the overhead without going, looking at it first right. because then it's too late. So, well, and to go back to what we were talking about on the pre-show time is that I think, you know, I think both of us prefer to do the conditioning by actually having the kids playing tennis. So, I mean, I don't do running exercises, you know, more than once or twice per practice. If we're having a heavy, a heavy training um, phase, then we might do two conditioning exercises, but generally we're just going to do one and it lasts five or 10 minutes. But, you know, the way I play my games at the end, the last 15 or 20 minutes of practice, it's such high energy and people are always moving that I know that they're getting aerobic yep. and anaerobic training from the playing of the games. And it, and it also, it's, it's good for morale because it tricks them into fitness. Yeah. They don't yep. account. They don't go, oh, man, we, coach made us run forever. They go home <laughs> and they go, oh, yeah, we played this crazy game for 20 minutes. That's, and, right. Yeah. Right. So they have exactly. no recollection. Well, and I, you know, I'm in full agreement on all fronts there. We, 
one of the things that we do is a lot of our drills, of course, there's always a different, there's a, 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 our philosophy changes depending on certain skill sets that we're trying to do. I don't want my kids too tired if I'm trying them to get them to learn a very specific stroke pattern mm. for say a, a more beginner. However, I, when a player has got that stroke pattern mastered, now we want to pressure them to the point where the exhaustion or the fatigue causes the stroke to break down. So when we get to that point, we need to go, okay, that's where your stroke is starting to break down. And so a lot of our drills, I'm with you, we basically our first hour of practice, although it, it varies based on different things, but we, we do a lot of, we have nine teaching carts with 325 balls in each. And usually in each cart, we have a, a movement drill where the players are feeding, one player is feeding five players, and they're, they're doing a crossover drill or, or back and forth drill or whatever. So they're getting a ton of movement, either forward, back, left, or right. Or we also do partner where they're, one player's got six or eight balls on their racket, and they're drop feeding uh, six balls. The player's moving from the very back, like you said, from the very, they start at the very back fence. So they have to learn. One of the things I bring up is like, you're way back here. Where do you think I don't want you to miss the ball? In the net. <laughs> because it's almost impossible to hit it out because you're so right. far back that gravity is right. going to bring whatever shot. So, I, you know, we want them to learn as they get closer to the net. So we're dropping balls, you know, five steps, you know, towards the net. So they're learning to uh, attack balls as they get closer to the net with more spin, less right. height whatever so if you can bounce that if you can bounce that ball over the opposite fence i'll give you a dollar there you go yeah (laughs) and then the other the other kind of closing aspect is one of the things i've learned in in the 40 seasons of coaching is that if i I see a lot of coaches focus on a lot of conditioning for a couple reasons one a lot of these coaches don't know how to drill so they default to, okay, I'm going to make my, I'm going to run my kids. They're going to be in great shape. Well, that's great. They get to the ball and they have no stroke. So, you know, it, it, we see that all the time. And so one of the things we work on is we work on conditioning in incremental steps that lead up to our postseason play, which is our, what we're trying to do is win state every year. Yeah. And so we try to win state. And in order to win state, we've got to win our region. In order to win region, we've got to win all of our matches. So we, kind of are building this and I see a lot of coaches a lot of teams get burned out because they focus so much on conditioning the kids are not looking forward to practice that being said we end every practice by bringing all 45 50 kids together and we do uh, either a series of blood and guts or we do back and forth over the alley which is a which is an agility drill and then we do our last sprints which are usually wind sprints to the net side straddle to the net yeah. Uh, things like that and so we and those usually don't last more than five six seven minutes so the kids feel like they really worked their butt off even they worked hard in the two and a half hours prior right but at the end of practice they know they've grown home and we worked hard at the end of practice so i mean there's different philosophies but that's there, how no we there do. are there are and i yeah i and i think I all of them are good that, but that, I, I i know what works best for my in my personality and how yeah. I bring what I want my kids to be excited about. And uh, so for the most part, that's what we do. Yeah. And I think, you know, it's really awesome to have these, you know, I mean, there's so many, there's a lot of similarities, but there's a lot of nuanced differences. So, I mean, the way it, we always kind of conclude is it's like, okay, you find your way. What, what works for you? I mean, right. I don't think, either of us would want somebody to try to be exactly like us. I mean, take, take the stuff that you, that resonates with you, work with it, find out right. how you can make it yours, you know? So anyway, but, uh, right. of course, but, but right. I'll, I'll close with one statement on that because if okay. a coach is not exposed to a lot of different ideas, they don't have a lot of ideas to go try. So I love, I just learned one, you know, you, 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 your spider drill we've done, but the one where you start at the base of the fence, go to the, I just picked up a new drill. And that's really These kind of things are great. I mean, yeah. I love the idea of going, okay, well, that gives me one more change of a pattern I can implement and see how my kids respond. And it might work better than anything I've done prior. So if yeah, I yeah, did yeah. not hear you tell me that, 
I would not own that. Well, and uh, yeah, let me throw one more thing in there too, because it is a tough drill. And what invariably happens is kids touch the fence for the, the final fence touch. Yeah. And then they come straggling into the baseline. <laughs> And I go, no, 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 no. We, it's not over until you get to the baseline. All right. Right. So we're going to do four of these. But if you give me 100% effort, every single one of you <laughs> all the way to the baseline, then we'll do three. Right. Right. If, but if, if any one of you slacks off, then we're all doing four. Like, like I promised you. You yep. can earn your way out of one with high effort. Because what do you, I mean, and, and, you know, and I go, I mean, quantity versus quality, what, what would you rather have? I mean, I'm, I love quality, but I'll take quantity if I have to. Uh, that's a great point. And, and that's where coaches need to be able to go. How can I still keep my kids excited, but still push them to, to become a more conditioned player that's not going to fatigue out in a tiebreaker in the third set i mean right right oh for sure and then they get the satisfaction of knowing that they won or lost but fitness wasn't a part of it they had right. the ability to hang in there absolutely all right hey thanks so much for another thanks Bill. another fun conversation and uh next week we'll be out here with a different topic so we'll have to think on that and what's logically next but I would say this, this video is more geared towards a coach who's just getting started and yep. needs to pre-think this stuff before they get going. And Let, let's encourage, uh, let's en encourage people to go ahead and send us their questions like we've gotten in the past. Let's have them feel free to yeah. feed us some, some stuff that we can address in the next one. Well, and then not only that, but we'd love to have you on to ask yeah. your question on video and then we can like flesh it out, further discuss it because if we don't fully answer your question the way you intended, then you can follow up that way. I mean, cause I, that's been right. frustrating for me when I ask a certain question and then the speaker has misinterpreted it. Right. And then they don't answer my question. <laughs> and yep. I'm like, oh, great. Uh, yeah. Still don't know what the answer is. <laughs> yeah, I still wish I knew. Now I got to go talk to them after. Anyway. All right. Thank okay. you. And have a great uh, weekend. We'll, we'll see everybody soon. Yep, next week probably. Perfect. All right, bye.